Welcome to a special lecture focused on Plato's Parmenides. Plato's Parmenides is a famous dialogue where Plato attempts to articulate the middle period of his theory of forms. The theory of forms is meant to demonstrate the relationship between sense perception of the world and logical form, or the content of our abstractions. Most philosophers interpret Plato's Parmenides as a logical exercise to extract the space of possible universes or beings, the genesis of form. The dialogue is a critical analysis of the theory of forms or the theory of ideas that takes place between Socrates, Parmenides, and also Zeno. Socrates attempts to explain the theory of forms, the theory of oneness or unity, what brings coherence and consistency to the sense perception of things, and attempts to put both Zeno's position that there cannot be a multiplicity and Parmenides' position that there is only one, or the monistic impulse, into his own theory of forms. Socrates articulates the theory as a relationship between the suprasensible ideas and sensible things. For example, when we find sensible things beautiful, Socrates would say that is because these things are participating in the idea of beauty. For Socrates, the idea of beauty is transhistorical or eternal, and the beautiful things are temporal, sensible, and fleeting. Thus, when sense perception partakes in ideas, it can give true form to sense content, where otherwise there would just be a chaotic multitude. One can think about this relationship between suprasensation or ideas and sensation or the world of things as a type of formal loop between sense perception and logical form. Parmenides, however, in the dialogue, suggests that the theory is inconsistent and contradictory, precisely because it does not take into consideration or include movement into the forms, or the oneness, or the unity. From the perspective of Plato's use of Parmenides as a character, this can be seen as a type of Platonic irony, considering that the actual historical Parmenides is known for his static conception of oneness. Thus, the fact that Parmenides introduces the idea of movement in the dialogue is a type of irony. Another interesting thing about the dialogue is that it is untypical of a Platonic dialogue for Socrates to be the one undermined in the course of the dialectic. Socrates is usually the figure who brings out contradictions and inconsistencies in other characters. In other words, Socrates normally functions as a point of negativity and not a positive source of knowledge. However, in this dialogue, the roles are strangely reversed. Socrates claims to have knowledge, and Parmenides is the point of negativity. In other words, Socrates articulates his theory of forms, and Parmenides says, wait, hold on, there are inconsistencies and contradictories because the forms do not have movement. In this motion of this point of negativity where contradictions and inconsistencies are pulled out from underneath a subject's position as a figure of knowing, one can interpret this as a motion in Lacanian and Jizikian terms as the collapse of the big other. Thus, Parmenides is here the function of collapsing Socrates' big other in terms of the eternal forms. Parmenides then attempts to do what is referred to as a type of dialectical gymnastics, Parmenides moves through all the possible relations between ideas, forms, and being, sense. In other words, Parmenides moves between all possible relations between eternity and temporality. Parmenides approaches this dialectical gymnastics under the presupposition that the one is a unity and that being is a multiplicity or otherness to the one. 
and that the possible relations between one and multiplicity, or logical forms and temporal being, is that of presence and absence. To state it simply, if the one is, if the one is present, what are the possible consequences for the others in being and time? On the other hand, if the one is not, what are the possible consequences for the others in being and time? The standard philosophical interpretations of this exercise is one of two options. Either this exercise is simply a language game, a logical exercise, with no real meaning or connection to being and time. In other words, it's totally impractical, but nonetheless interesting to do from the point of view of logic in itself. Another position is that this is a type of negative theology. In other words, the one is, in the end, unsayable and unspeakable. We can really not really have a conclusive, positive answer of what the status of the one is and its relationship to others. But nonetheless, it is an important theological exercise. These two interpretations can be classified as, on the one hand, postmodern, Everything is just a language game, a logical exercise, and the one has no real practical relationship to being. Or traditional. There is a one, and it's important to think about it, theological implications, but we can never have a rational or a linguistic grasp of the one. These two interpretations, the postmodern and the traditional philosophical interpretations, are a result of the fact that from this Parmenidean logical exercise, there is really no positive result. There's no one hypothesis which we can say conclusively structures the relationship between ideas and being. Thus, when we go into each of the eight positions, all eight of them have contradictions. All eight of them have points of impossibility or inconsistencies. And that negative feature the fact that all eight positions have contradictions and inconsistencies, can be turned into a positive feature. In other words, what if we work from the idea that the one itself is a contradiction, that the one itself is only accessible by playing with contradictions and seeing the pattern or the deeper structure in the contradictions themselves? One might call this a esoteric reading of Plato against the standard idealist reading, and a parallax shift on the status and the nature of ideas. The fact that there is no positive result in terms of our knowledge and our understanding of the one, the universal negativity of the status of the one, is a sign that ideas are in a becoming against their own absolute knowledge, or the negative result is itself absolute knowledge. The dialogue itself here is structured in two parts. The first part is the Socratic hypothesis. The second part is the Parmenidean theses, the eight logical deductions. In the first part, Socrates attempts to resolve the status of ideas as eternal by claiming that paradox and contradiction and opposition are a part of temporal being, the fact that in our temporal being, our lives are structured by paradoxes, contradictions, and oppositions, irreducibly. However, ideas in themselves, according to Socrates, are not paradoxical, not contradictory, and not in opposition. As stated earlier, Parmenides rejects this Socratic idea and suggests that it's flawed because the ideas in themselves need to have motion, need to have form that moves, and then suggests that the only way to allow the ideas themselves to have form and move is if the ideas in themselves are contradictory and are oppositional. Parmenides then further suggests that only when this is achieved that we can collapse the distinction between being and time and ideas and form as part of the same process. The consequence is, is that Parmenides' dialogue is a logical exercise or a language game. But 
we have to see it as part of the eternal ideas. In other words, the eternal ideas resolve themselves as time. We still need the logical forms to understand temporal being, but we don't need the distinction between sense perception and logical form. The meditation of logical form to sensual being is the process by which eternal ideas make sense of themselves. Thus, the eight hypotheses are not a opening to a postmodern plurality of universes where anything goes and everything is truth and all universes are possible and true. Rather, the different forms or plurality, or the matrix of plurality, has a meta-structural logic that can be discerned by understanding the logic of contradiction, in this case, the impossibility of eternity in or as time. Thus, the impossibility at work in the ideas is their symmetry with being and time. There is a gap between ideas and being. Ideas cannot reconcile being and time. There is being and time and ideas and forms that attempt to make sense of them, give order, coherence, and consistency. But they cannot do it absolutely which leads to a type of fracture or gap of different possible interpretations of the relationship between the one and being. It is only possible in hindsight, with historical hindsight, in retrospect, to understand that there might be a possible ninth hypothesis of the matrix itself. In other words, all eight hypotheses are in some sense valid, part of the one idea as eternally changing collapsing the meaning between the difference between logical form and being and time. The one idea is nothing but the process of being and time. Now let's run through all the eight hypotheses to understand their internal logical form, coupled with a possible meta-interpretation of the ninth hypothesis. Thesis 1. There is a one. In other words, there is a super-essential eternal absolute, and all temporal logical forms are a reflection of this eternal form. This one, however, does not participate with being and time. Our reason and language cannot grasp the oneness or the unity. There is always a distance between our language and reason and it. Thus, there is a multiplicity of possible philosophical positions, or rational linguistic stances. Unity of the one can never really be achieved in language and reason. There can never be a universal coherence of positions. Unity with the one can only be achieved in a type of mystical ecstasy, or a non-rational, non-linguistic space. Thus, we cannot define the one. We cannot perceive the one. We cannot know the one, not in reason and not in language, not in being nor in time. However, there still is a one. And this is typically the position of what we could consider the Neoplatonic interpretation or the mystical interpretation. These historical subjects believe there is a one, but they do not believe that it can be communicated rationally or linguistically, that it has to be experienced mystically. Thesis 2. There is a one. There is a super-essential eternal absolute. And all temporal logical forms are a reflection of this eternal form. However, this one actively participates in being and time, but is at the same time different from being and time. Thus there is a two, eternal ideas and being and time, but with no gap. Everything is one. Reason and language, thus, cannot differentiate truth and non-truth because everything is truth. We can see the one in everything, and all mute motion is infused with one. There is oneness in the tree, oneness in the moon, oneness in a grain of sand, that all finite things are also infinite. This leads to self-referential paradoxes, or infinite regresses. If infinity is in everything, all finite things, and there is no end and no beginning to anything. There is no way to discriminate of what is a one and what isn't. 
This position is often taken up by Spinozan naturalists or even classical physics, where basically everything is part of the absolute, but is at the same time different from the absolute itself, that we study finite natural things, but there still is an infinite absolute. Thesis number three, there is a one, a super essential eternal absolute, and all temporal logical forms are a reflection of this eternal form. However, in this situation, being and time participates in the one as parts. They do this, and they know this, when they reach their internal limit, or gain direction, or find a structural wholeness. In this way, reason and language touch the one, or are universalized by the one on these levels, when they work in relationship to limits work in relationship to clear, coherent direction, and work in relationship to structural wholeness. One acts as a limit to other humans. One acts in such a way is that it allows humans to find internal and intersubjective organization in and as a one. When they cannot participate in the one, they fall into and call it chaotic multitude. The most obvious forms of historical subjectivities that identify with this position are Platonic idealists or conservative transcendentalists, who are always in a battle between gaining internal order that reflects an et eternity or falling into a chaotic multitude which they find as a sophistic language game. Thesis number four, there is a one, a super essential eternal absolute and all temporal logical forms are a reflection of this eternal form. However, this one has no relation at all to being in time. Being in time is a pure chaotic multitude. Language and reason on the side of humans cannot be integrated or universalized. There can be no building up towards an understanding of unified knowledge or unified forms. Humans cannot say anything about the one, nothing coherent about the one. And there is nothing universal about being or time either. There is no true aboutness or no ability for predication. The most common interpretation of this metaphysical situation can be seen in the logic of absurdus, that meaning is in itself absurd. There is no eternal meaning. There is no direction. There is no wholeness. There is only chaotic multitude or cynics, who are negative about human motivations and civilizations where the appearance of the one takes hold over individuals and where appearance of the one starts to structure motion, or skeptics, who are negative about any notion of eternal truth or anything essential or supernatural about the world. Thesis 5. There is not a one. There is no super essential eternal absolute and all temporal logical forms are a reflection of nothing at all. In this situation, one is not. Being in time or our language games can predicate it, but it is just a true fiction. There really is just a multiplicity without a one. But the one nonetheless still functions as a fiction. That's why the one is not. The one can give coherence and so forth, even though it is not reflecting anything eternally true, or it is not reflecting any deeper substance. Human ideas about form and unity and oneness are only a similarity to, but not actually a one. Not a one as a one, but a one as non-being. What there is is just being in time plus the reflection of a self as an immaterial surface. The most common metaphysical interpretations along these lines can be found in historical humans who identify as Stoics. Stoics do not have any relationship to eternal ideas. There is only our sense perception plus self-work. We cannot have contact with the eternal ideas as a way to obfuscate or to hide or to uh, pretend that we aren't doing real deep self-work. In philosophy, 
This could also be interpreted along similar lines to Deleuze's notion of sense and logic as a sense event, or a pure surface, and not a deeper idea or eternal reality. Thesis 6. There is no one, no super-essential eternal absolute, and all temporal logical forms are a reflection of nothing at all. In this situation, the one is a total non-entity. In other words, the one is not even a symbolic fiction. Being in time cannot predicate anything at all of a one. The one gives no utility, no validity, and reason and language are only useful as a negation. One is not even known in its non-being. The most common historical subjectivity who resonates with this metaphysical position could be seen as either nihilists, who feel like there is no point to existence, there is no oneness to existence, there is just again the chaotic multitude, or sophists, who believe the truth of speech has no external guarantee, no connection or relationship to eternal substance. Thesis 7. There is no one, or super-essential eternal absolute, and all temporal logical forms are a reflection of nothing at all. The one is not, and being and time are just imaginary illusions. Symbolic fiction is here just a fiction of a fleeting coherence. All there is is a fleeting, substanceless appearance. Humans are one in that they gain a temporal, fragile consistency, but this is just a fleeting illusion. Thus, the historical subjectivities who express and relate to this metaphysical position most deeply are either the Buddhists or cognitive scientists. For Buddhists, there is just the truth of meditation of the inner void that is privileged over temporal appearances, which are just fleeting illusions. Or for modern cognitive science, where there is no true self, there is no true knowledge, there are just appearances and no homunculus or no point at which you reach the truth. Thesis number eight. There is no one. There is no super essential eternal absolute. All temporal logical forms are a reflection of nothing at all. In this situation, one is a non-entity and being and time are also nothing. What there is are just perspectives of appearances and everything is relative to these perspectives. In this situation, not only is the one nothing and the appearance is nothing, but that means that humans are themselves a nothingness. Nothing exists. There is a multiplicity of multiplicities and the void of the perspective. The most common metaphysical interpretation and the most common historical subjectivities that resonate with this view could be seen as a type of perspectivism, that truth is relative to a perspective or also solipsism that solipsists would state that there is no way in which you can gain true knowledge outside of your own perspective. In summary, these eight positions are a series of theses on the status of the one and the meditation on the different possibilities of the one as present or absent, coupled with its consequences for being in time or the others. From Neoplatonic mysticism, Spinozan naturalism, Platonic idealism, absurdist universe, stoic rationalism, sophist universe, Bod Buddhist appearances, perspectival solipsism. These are all like metaphysical logical atoms of possible worlds, derived from the presence absence of the one and its consequences. However, from a Hegelian historical perspective, or a historical phenomenological perspective, this doesn't yet help us understand the matrix itself. In order to understand the matrix itself, we might have to consider a ninth hypothesis. In this ninth hypothesis, we consider that the one is a synthesis of both all logical, positive, and negative situations. The contradiction in itself, as referred to earlier, where Parmenides suggested that in order to get movement into the ideas, we had to suggest that the ideas are themselves contradictory, both positive and negative. Thus, the eternal absolute essence both is and is not, including all eight hypotheses, which correspond to eight different logical historical subjects. This means that the one and being and time are the same thing. Logical meditation of being and time 
is the one form as a temporal appearance. By placing contradiction into ideas themselves, there is no contradiction with the one that is and is not simultaneously. And contradiction disappears as a negative feature and is immediately the way in which you gain access to truth. One form can give coherence, and nothing can exist, function within a framework. Both are true. In relationship to an existentialist interpretation, human positivity or oneness can emerge from negativity, a chaotic multitude, the way in which a self comes to an internal feeling of I am a self. However, human negativity, not oneness, of falling apart, of disintegrating, can also function as a neutral absorbing element or a void in the chaotic multiplicity. The best example of a historical subject who internalizes and works with this logic could be a historical dialectical subject, where positive language and reason deploys itself only to annihilate itself as time. Or psychic analysis, where an analyst neutrality allows for positive language reason to destroy itself through coming to understand its own internal inconsistencies and contradictions. The analyst is here a nothing within a positive framework. Thus, to summarize the matrix inclusive of the ninth hypothesis as a meta-historical perspective on the different logical forms of subjectivity in history, or a movement of the eternal ideas, we get a logical sense of the very process in which historical subjectivity moves through time. The conclusion that we can draw from this is that reality in itself is nothing but a confused mess, eight logical possibilities between ideas and sense. In this ultimate meta-interpretation, there is no realm of ideas external to the cosmos. The one all, or the realm of ideas, is nothing but the eternal changes of being and time. And in the end, there is nothing but this movement itself, as it deploys itself and destroys itself. And that was an overview of Plato's Parmenides and his dialogue on the theory of forms, where I attempted to demonstrate the way in which Plato articulated the relationship between sense perception and logical form. This logical exercise was an attempt to extract the space of all possible universes and beings, the genesis of their form. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening.